Hi, everybody. Hey. You enjoying Halcott? Woo! You might have seen us sticking around. My name's AJ. And I'm Teddy. We're the hosts of Interspace on the Space Channel. We hope you've had fun so far. We've had an amazing weekend here. It's been so it has been absolutely a blast. And uh, please give some applause for the volunteers who volunteered their time. Everyone who organized it. And I uh, hope you guys are ready for one of the big highlights uh, of the con. It's a real honor for Teddy and I to get to do this. He's a bit more of an eloquent speaker at times, so I'm going to pass the mic to him for this introduction. I love it when he lies to me. That's amazing. I'm uh, so excited to introduce, uh, to introduce your next guest. Obviously, we all know and love him as Pavel Chekhov in Star Trek, the original series, as well as the films with the original cast. And of course, it's Alfred Bester, the amazing antagonist on Babylon 5. But of course, he's also had an amazing and iconic acting career outside of those two amazing achievements. He's acted opposite other genre greats like Bruce Campbell. He's worked for Alfred Hitchcock. He's also a notable author of both fiction and nonfiction. He's written and starred in several critically acclaimed plays. And on top of all of that, he created a comic book series and he's done some really notable international humanitarian work. When you think of the term Renaissance man, this guest totally embodies it. It's our pleasure to introduce Walter Koenig. strenuous activity I usually reserve till two or three in the afternoon. <laughs> but, um, in any case, thank you for being here. I've, I've had a terrific time. Uh, we can sit down, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a terrific time being in Halifax. Uh, I wouldn't have expected less, but the, the, the folks have been very uh, friendly, very warm, very congenial. Uh, very enthusiastic, as they, they are everywhere. You know, if it, was, if it was the people who attended conventions uh, globally, who ran the world, we would have a lot fewer problems. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know, I said ran, I mean attended as well. Because, uh, it, you know, I, I just came back from Russia. And, uh, aside from the language, it was another Star Trek convention, or actually it was a Babylon 5 convention, with, with folks who uh, espoused the same beliefs that uh, uh, we uh, uh, promulgated on um, Star Trek and, uh, uh, and you know, believe in a better future and a place where everybody, at least on this planet, could find a way to get together. And, Embrace each other's ethnicities, differences, creeds, nationalities, races, and uh, that's why I tend these things because uh, I just find that commonality of belief so refreshing, and so different than what I'm exposed to, and what I think most of us are exposed to in the real world, where venality and uh, self-interest seem to be. Question, because you were just talking about the the uh, motives of, of Star Trek, the message that it uh, delivered. Do you think that's what led to the success of the franchise, or is it something else? Well, I think the introduction of Chekhov. <laughs> Good storytelling. We had really good science fiction writers, not simply you know, television hacks, but people who wrote short science fiction sort of stories and novels. And people like Ted Sturgeon and Harlan Ellis and uh, at all, you know, that we, we had some really uh, Norman, Norman something, somebody else, Block, John Block, Robert Block, Robert Block. Um, people who really knew the material and really 
could bring to it you know, a fresh perspective. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't my grandfather's science fiction. It was, uh, it was very current and very, uh, very topical. It you know, addressed issues that were uh, significant and played, played you know, philosophical roles in our lives. So all of that, the fact that it was, it was you know, that it was intelligently written, um, the fact that we had talented actors uh, playing the roles, all of that, I think, uh, led to its, its, uh, its success. If you, ask, you know, ask me qualitatively, you know, what portion was it, you know, how much of it was, what was responsible for how much of it, you know, the, the, art, the artistry, the politics, the, I don't know. And I don't really know why it should continue. Uh, I, I mean, it has, I'm sure there have been sociological studies about Star Trek's success as a reflection of uh, you know, the way the, the society behaves. But then we're talking about all the societies. Because you know, I've been to Germany, and I've been to Brazil, and I've been to Russia, and I've uh, been to the UK. Uh, and, uh, they all embrace Star Trek for the same reasons. So, um, so I think it's, it's, it's all those things together. But why this show more than any other? I, 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 don't, I don't know how to answer that. You, um, you, you mentioned uh, you know Star Trek the original series going from great to iconic with the addition of Chekhov. We would all agree, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping you can just ch talk a little bit about the introduction of Chekhov at the beginning of season two. Um, you know, the, the Mr. Roddenberry's motivation and maybe what attracted you to the, uh, to the role. Mr. Roddenberry's motivation was very pragmatic. You know, regardless of what you've heard, the uh, Pravda did not complain that there wasn't a Russian <laughs> in Star Trek. Um, Pravda didn't even know about it. So, uh, you know, the Iron Curtain was very firmly in place. Star Trek was not being seen behind the, uh, in, in the in the Soviet Union. What was being seen was the monkeys. <laughs> hey, hey, where are the monkeys? <laughs> and uh, they thought that it was time uh, to bring aboard somebody who would appeal to that specific demographic, the eight to 14 year olds. You know, who wrote a line paper and that song <laughs> and thought uh, and spoke in terms of groovy. And, uh, so, Chekhov was brought aboard, brought aboard for that purpose. Little did these eight to 14 years old know that I was not 22 at the time, but I was 31. Uh, I didn't have this cute accent that it was made up, and that I was married, you know? Uh, <laughs> so uh, that was very disillusioned. Yeah, that was the first great disillusionment of the, of the uh, 60s. <laughs> the history books record that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the, the actual story is interesting, only because, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, contrasted, or in, 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 in light of the weight of, of my, uh, I'm not saying this quite well, participation in Star Trek, the influence it's had on my life, you know, it's been extraordinary. And the, the actual event of my being cast is so inauspicious that it, it's, you know, it becomes the stuff of uh, stories. I, uh, I, was, I had played a Russian in another show, uh, a guest starring role in another TV series, and the casting director brought me in. I'd already worked for not only the cast director, but I'd worked for Gene Roddenberry in another series that he had done. I played a guest role in another series. And one of the two uh, alternating directors in that second year uh, there's a fellow named Joe Petney, and I've done a guest starring role on uh, the Alfred Hitchcock Hour that you were referring to. Um, so three of the four people involved in the decision already knew my work, and they only brought in one other actor. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. You, know, you, you come in, you're one of a dozen, and then they thin the, they thin the herd, and they keep coming, have you come back, and they put you on tape, and, you know, and then the network has to uh, agree to it. So it's a much more painful process than it was for me. I came in, uh, I, I, I'd seen what the dialogue was, and the dialogue you know, ex expressed a lot of jeopardy and you know, some 
fear. It's something that you order a kit in the ship is about to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with all the naivete of a, of a, of a very young officer. And, I, you know, when I was sitting outside, I was, I was, before I went in, I was trying to, uh, you know, capture the immediacy of this danger and make sure that I express it with some, with some sense of truth. And um, so I, I read the lines with clenched jaw and furrowed, furrowed brow and beaded sweat. <laughs> <laughs> you got this feeling I've told, told this story before. <laughs> and I got done and they said, yeah, Walter, that's very nice. Hmm. You make it funny. We <laughs> <laughs> had this image, you know. And my God, you know, I, I grew up with her. You know, I, 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 I learned that you, know, you, have to, you have to approach the work with integrity, you know, and you cannot prostitute yourself. And you must, you know, you must try to cull from your most inner self the, 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 those feelings and present them in as honest a way as you can. So, with all that, that in, my, in my training, the second time I read it, I said, Captain, guess what? <laughs> she is about to blow up. <laughs> That's what got me the roll. <laughs> the story doesn't actually end there, because 